Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today we're listening to The Friends by Maggie Irobani. The Friends by Maggie Nurse Irobani. Mrs. Sadie Wentworth Higgins hobbled into the library, looking irritated. She couldn't understand me when I told her about the raffle. Well, you put in your name to win a prize. I don't know what it is. It's just fun. It's free. She finally acquiesced and headed inside. I sighed, imagining Stephen getting her seated. I clearly drew the short straw at the holiday gathering committee and ended up here, leaning on the encyclopedia case in the reference section, right outside the glass doors of the rare book room, welcoming all the mostly elderly friends of the library, repeating directions. You have to write your name on the slip of paper. The slip of paper. Yes, yes, that's right. I stood staring ahead out of the library's front entrance, and I became aware of a creeping anxiety. A bad idea was coming on. I knew Stephen wouldn't have done what I was about to do, that's for sure. He would have been too busy answering reference questions, unclogging toilets, shifting large quantities of books. He would have known his place, in the background, keeping everyone happy. Important things to know about Stephen. His soft smile when he thought something was really funny, the right corner of his mouth turning up. In his job as building advocate, I scouted out the ladies' room every time there was an issue, making sure it was clear of ladies for his entrance, carrying his toolbox. Rephrase it in the form of a reference question. That's what he said when I asked him something he couldn't answer. The meaning of life. We swam together every day at lunch at the college pool, walking down the hill, sometimes even sharing a lane. At the end of the day, we walked to catch the 523 back into the city. I always yawned when he gave me directions. I'm not that boring, am I? We traded quiet smiles a lot when our colleagues were particularly ridiculous, like when Noreen was talking at Decibel 5000 about her impending divorce on the circulation desk phone. He always lent me $20 at the end of the month. Every Monday, I sat on the stool by his desk and told him about my weekend. He would look at the clock and say, tapping his watch, you have 10 minutes. He unwrapped his sandwich in the staff room, the same kind every day, ham and butter on day-old wheat, always asking me if I wanted some. We both worried we would forget to clean the community coffee pot on our designated day and pictured the library burned to the ground. I helped him clean up the flood on the basement floor, hot water shooting up in the air from an old, unused shower. We sopped up the water with rare newspapers. He ran to the bathroom, the ladies, when someone used the excuse that I was sick in there to lure him to the staff room for a birthday surprise. I saw the concern on his face as he raced in, and I felt both guilty and loved. He told me at the copier that his cancer had spread to his liver. I put my foot in it. You know I love you to death, right? Back to my bad idea, the one Stephen would never have gotten involved in. In prior years, there had been just one raffle. So that day, slouched against my encyclopedias, dreaming of getting on the train back to the city, I felt a bit desperate and got the idea of writing some fun words on the slips of paper for the raffle, just to cheer myself. What were the chances of them getting called? Zero. Zilch. Ho, 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 I scribbled smiling, feeling brave. Next, I wrote, fa-la-la-la-la. It was a holiday party, after all. Something about writing those first silly words loosened something held tight inside me. Recklessly, a little hysterically, I started a series of names. Mike, Row Wave, Mag, Azine, Jim, Nasium. I wasn't drunk, but I felt a small, insane giggle escape my lips. I added another ho, 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 just to seal the deal. As any good reference librarian would, had he been standing beside me, Stephen would have asked the pertinent questions. What are you hoping to achieve by this? What will you do if one of them gets called? Is this actually funny? Is this respectful to the friends of the library? How do you know for sure there is only one prize? Oh, that last question was one I should have pondered but there was something about Stephen's endless absence, that end-of-the-workday malaise, the presence of the very old, 
the ticking clock on the main floor carpet, the giant medieval tapestry hanging in the stairwell, the book smell, my bruised heart. All I wanted was the next thing, something easy and frivolous, meaningless, so that giant globe that lit up ahead of me, beckoned me, said, write another phony name. Who cares? The last question, the one about if I was sure there would be just one raffle ticket, that one, that was really the important one. Because as it turned out, there were five prizes that year. When I tried to rescind my erroneous entries, I approached Selma, freshly emerged from her computery lair, and when I tried to take the raffle bowl away from her, her expression became all contorted. We began this yank forward, yank back thing that made her face screw up at me. What is your problem? She asked with one last yank. So I gave up, knowing I needed to stand back and watch just how this thing was going to play out. Sweating slightly, gnawing on a piece of candied grapefruit peel, the bitter stuff we made fun of every year. I took my penance orally and leaned against the back display case, the one holding part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, or something. It was good old art librarian herself, Lillian Gilcrest, High Hill College 54, who would be first to pick the names. Lillian was super fancy and proper. No cool new librarian glasses for her, old school to the core. Removing the shh finger permanently sewed to her lips, a favorite joke. Her hand reached into the bowl of paper while I repeated my mantra to myself. There is no way, no way, there is no way. Her hand swished around. Get on with it, Lillian. I sip my punch, the sweet ginger ale taste lingering in the back of my mouth. When I saw her face screw up in annoyance, I knew, I knew. She looked at Selma and said bitterly, someone is trying to be smart. Her hand crumpled the raffle ticket in, if not anger, deep annoyance. I looked around. The friends shrugged, looked around themselves. Some didn't hear. Mrs. McPhelps was snoozing. Then Marilyn, yes, Marilyn, my boss, stuck her hand in. So elegant. I wondered if she would sit me down and lecture me after this. I deserved it for sure. She moved her manicured hand through the bowl and calmly said, with her best high hill accent, Mike Rowav, fancily pronouncing my joke name. No one flinched. She called it again. I shrunk, realizing how I should have told Stephen, but that was impossible. I should have told someone, because having a joke by yourself isn't very fun. The pain continued, like a knife twisting in my chest. She shook her head and reached in again. Jim nauseum? Marilyn did it again, calling the overpronounced version of the name. She called out several times, looking for this Jim nauseum fellow in the crowd. How could Mike and Jim not be here after entering the raffle? No one caught on. As Marilyn stood, nonplussed, slightly laughing and going back into the bowl for another name, I shot forward, unable to take it any more. Those, those were joke names. I put them in. Microwave, get it? Microwave. And gymnasium, like gymnasium. It all sounded so stupid, so infantile. Old Mr. Tyler's mouth dropped. He looked horrified. Well, Salma said, you will not receive your pack of greeting cards my punishment more embarrassing than the crime. Everyone laughed uncomfortably. My face reddened and shone with sweat. The sweets I had imbibed curdled in my tightening throat. Afterwards, I really thought I saw him out amongst the friends, picking up plates, scraping onion dip off the priceless rug. But each time I got close, he melted into someone else. Going home, exiting the library in December darkness, I walked alone to the train, still feeling the heat of my shame, desperately hoping he would be at the station. Delusional. I looked from commuter face to face as we all searched west down the tracks for the incoming. I guess it was all just one more life lesson. Some things you can't relive. Some things you can't take back, make better. Sometimes it's just too late.
Stephen always knew this. The end. That was The Friends, written and read by Maggie Irabani. If you've enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe so you can listen to a new story on the first of every month. Thank you and goodbye.